Okay. Hi. Hi, Jamie. Hi, Becky. We are back for another professional talk just to dive deeper into polyvagal theory and our work with our kids at this time of COVID-19 and the pandemic. And um, today we also are joined by Jamie Holland, who is going to introduce herself. Uh, Jamie, why don't you do that? And then Becky will come back around and you and I will just give a quick intro for those who are watching this and not the previous talk that we did. How about that? Sound good? Jamie, all you. Yeah, hi. Hi. Thank you so much for uh, having me on today, Mary. Um, I am a pediatric physical therapist and I've been working um, for about 13 years now, uh, 10 of those in New York City. I work with usually the smaller babies, you know, under three, but, um, you know, I've treated children of all ages and um, uh, specialize in, you know, general developmental delays. Um, yeah, and I uh, watched your last talk with Becky and it was very interesting to me from a, a clinician standpoint and a parent standpoint, so can't wait to hear more. Sounds great. Well, we're really happy to have you and uh, your experience here just to chat with us about the applications of this within the physical therapy arena and early childhood work. So um, just I'll talk briefly and then I'm going to pass everything off to Becky because Becky's going to go into more on polyvagal theory with us. So I'm Mary Neely. I am a learning specialist, special educator. I work with students all the way from nursery through even college sometimes in, in different types of tutoring, uh, school placement consulting, and I work with schools as well to help them reach their students in a myriad of ways. So I'm gonna turn things over to Becky now and we're gonna keep it going. All right, um, well, I'm Becky Lewin. I'm an occupational therapist. Um, I work here in New York City. Um, I I'm part of a small private practice, and I also do some consulting for schools and organizations, and I had such a nice time chatting with Mary a few weeks ago, so I'm thrilled to be back and chatting again and um, talking to you guys about polyvagal theory. So uh, should, we, should we jump right in? Yes. So um, I'm going to share my screen so I can show you guys some visuals for those of us that are visual learners. Um, but for those of you that learn better just from listening, that's, that's cool too. So let's see. Okay. So I will start off by just saying, you know, the polyvagal theory is, is vast and covers so much. So this will just be sort of the broad brushstrokes of the theory. And I think regardless of, you know, this is the first and last time you hear about it, <laughs> um, I think you'll be able to take something away. Or if this begins you down like a, you know, a polyvagal rabbit hole, if you will, um, then, you know, your, your learning has just begun. For me, uh, when I first sort of heard about the theory, um, I was then sent down a uh, metaphorical rabbit hole of just wanting to learn more, reading, listening to lectures. There's just so much material out there. So, um, but again, even if you just get these broad brushstrokes, I think there's so much we can take from uh, the theory in terms of how we work with children, but even more so how we how we work with people, how we um, how we relate to people, how we how we even relate to ourselves. So I think there's just so many applications. So it's a really um, rich theory that can just have so many different jumping or off points professionally um, and personally. So, so let's start. Um, you know, the, the polyvagal theory was um, created by Dr. Stephen Porges. He has so many incredible nuggets of wisdom, but I thought he kind of sums up his theory best. And he says the bottom line is the understanding that the human nervous system, like other mammalian species, is on a quest. And that quest is for safety. And we use others to help us feel safe. Um, and I think that really sums up, again, the theory is very nuanced, but I think that sums up you know, a lot of sort of the basic idea of what this theory is looking at. How do we feel safe as humans? Um, and why is that so important? 
So how do we feel safe? And then also how do we process and make sense of when we feel like we're in danger? Oh, oh there we go. So again, just some big picture principles of this theory. Um, uh, Poor just came up with his own term of how we detect safety and danger. Um, and he calls it our, our neuroception. So neuroception is this ability that we have as humans, as, as mammals, um, because animals, mammals, um, all mammals or most mammals experience this too. But we have this incredible ability to detect safety and danger without our, our, our conscious awareness. So we created this term neuroception and it's this sort of this feeling we get that we can't always make sense of um, when we feel safe and also when we feel like, like, we're, like there's a threat. Um, and these feelings um, can come from within our body, right? So we can get body feelings that let us know something isn't quite right. We can get messages from the environment that let us know something isn't quite right. Or we can even get messages from other people so between people that let us know something isn't quite right, right? It's that feeling we get. On the flip side, we can also get neurocept safety, cues of safety, cues of connection that let us know like everything is, is, is good. You know, we are safe, we are protected. Um, we don't have to be reacting defensively. So that's a huge part um, of the theory and sort of our, our neuroception or our ability to take in those cues and sort of have a reaction to that, you know, is this safe, is this dangerous? Then there's sort of these three predictable pathways of response that our nervous system has, right? So there's this hierarchy of responses um, that, we're, that I'm going to talk about really quickly uh, that our autonomic nervous system um, will have. So again, this idea we take in um, cues of safety, cues of danger, our nervous system will respond to that. And this other really important principle that he has is that the ability to co-regulate is a biological imperative. So it is, it is crucial for our survival to be able to connect with other people. Um, and we looked at, you know, look at that across, again, mammals need to have that ability to connect in order to survive. So that's a really key part of the theory that he comes back to that ability to co-regulate. Um, with other, with mom and dad, with friends, to be part of the group, to be part of the tribe, to be part of the pack. Um, that's so critical for our survival. Um, so those are sort of, you know, the main principle, you know, some of the main principles of the theory. But I want to dive a little bit into the nervous system because this is where really, you know, a lot of the meat is of, of the theory. So we just have to have like a little itty bitty baby uh, crash course in the autonomic nervous system. Um, so we have our autonomic nervous system, and this system is in charge of things that we don't really have to think about, like breathing or digesting our food or our heart rate, right? Like we don't control those things. We don't think about breathing usually. Um, maybe lately we do, right? Because we're told to breathe, but um, we don't, we can't think through our heart rate. We can't think through digestion. It just kind of happens. That's the job of our autonomic nervous system. And the system breaks out into two branches. We have our sympathetic branch and our parasympathetic branch. And our, sympath our sympathetic branch is sometimes known of as our fight or flight branch, right? This is our mobilization branch. This lets us know like I'm in danger and I'm gonna get out of here. And if I can't get out of here, I'm gonna fight you, <laughs> right? So it's a really active, mobilized state. Um, our heart rate goes up, our breathing becomes shallow, muscles become tense. There's a whole host of physiological changes that happen to us when we, when we go into that mobilized state. So that's fairly straightforward from you know, the polyvagal perspective, right? That's our sympathetic branch. Our parasympathetic is a little bit more nuanced. And you might've heard of it um, before called you know, the rest and digest system, but that doesn't really paint the full picture of what the parasympathetic branch can do. So it's gonna get a little nitty gritty and then we'll zoom out, I promise. So the parasympathetic branch breaks into two branches, the dorsal vagal circuit and the ventral vagal circuit. The words aren't so important, 
dorsal means back, ventral means front, and the, it's polyvagal, so there are many branches to the vagus. But what's important to know is that this dorsal vagal circuit, which is part of that sympathetic branch, is our immobilization branch. It sends us into a deep state of shutdown. Our body beca can become numb. There's this massive drop in blood pressure. Our heart rate drops significantly. Um, sometimes it can, pe people will describe it almost like dissociation. Sometimes our body goes limp um, or fainting happens. In animals, this can look like death fainting when an animal pretends to play dead. So this very extreme uh, shutdown that the body goes into um, in order to survive. The ventral vagal circuit um, is our safe and social network. It's that safe and social mode that we can go into. And um, this allows for um, social connection. This promotes our executive functioning skills. This promotes health and growth and restoration throughout our whole body. So what's so interesting, um, and if you read uh, Dr. Porges's work, you know, that sort of within that parasympathetic on that same, within that same system, there are these two extreme sort of um, responses or uh, autonomic nervous system reactions that can come from, uh, come from that same sort of um, nerve. So that's the like big picture. So again, we have, so let's go actually to this next picture because maybe I, I love this picture um, because Deb Dana, she's a therapist who's written extensively on the theory. She compares um, the, she puts the polyvagal theory on a ladder. So if we think about that ladder, that hierarchy, the ventral vagal, that's our safe and social, that's when we're connected to people around us. That's when we're using our executive function skills. That's when we're creative and dynamic and problem solving and working with other people. And if we fall down the ladder, right? If we detect, if our neuroception says something dangerous happening, I gotta respond to that danger. We go down the ladder into that fight or flight mode. And if we can't solve the problem in fight or flight, or I should actually say, if we encounter a danger, and we can't solve it in, you know, if we can't work with others around us to solve the problem, we'll go down to sympathetic. And if we can't solve the problem there, we can't, you know, fix the, fix the danger or get ourselves out of that situation, then we'll drop down even further. So it's a hierarchy that builds on each other. And this isn't by choice. This isn't something that, you know, you have uh, control over. Your body just responds and everyone's body respond slightly differently. So um, that's really important to, to remember that it's, you know, what one person perceives as dangerous, another person might not. So what sends one person into a mobilized state might not send another person into a mobilized state. And what might send one person into shutdown might not send another person into shutdown. So um, it's sort of, it's a personal experience. And it's the, you know, it's, the perception of the threat or that neuroception of the threat, even if you know you and I know that person is perfectly safe. <laughs> so, you know, I have a bunch of terms also that, you know, Mary, we could talk if it would be helpful to put a link to this, um, but I don't, I don't think we need to go through all of these terms. I guess what I would say is, you know, again, those are sort of the, 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 the big picture um, of some of, I think, the most important parts of the theory. And, you know, depending on the work you do, uh, you can almost start to feel those connections happening if you're thinking about kids that you work with or families that you work with. And, you know, you start to shift your mind to thinking about what state is that child in? Mm -hmm. And is the behavior I'm seeing, or I would say, I, my guess is that behavior that we are seeing is a reflection of the state. And if we can think about moving kids, adults, whoever, partners, children, what have you, um, up the ladder and helping them move, shift through the state, um, would we, you know, how would that change our practice? How would that, that change um, our relationships? Uh, how would that change your approach? Um, I know for me in my practice, it has changed it uh, dramatically. Um, when I think, when I kind of shift my lens to thinking about things this way. And I think that um, 
especially now in the climate that we're in, it's, you know, it's so important to be thinking about, again, that, um, that lens of, you know, are people perceiving danger? And, and I would say many people are. And how does that affect our ability to learn, our ability to stay connected, um, our ability to use sort of executive, you know, more, more of those executive functioning skills that, you know, kids are asked to use when they go to school, right? Or they show up for therapy. Those are the skills we're asking kids to access. Um, so we have to ask ourselves, are those skills even available? Um, so <laughs> I think that is, you know, again, very big picture. There's so much nuance here. That's really fun to talk about. Um, you know, everything from mixed states um, to, so when there's a little bit of sympathetic and a little bit of so safe and social to, you know, how do we climb up and down the ladder? But, you know, I can stop here um, just to check in with you guys and see like, you know, I've just thrown a lot out there. So. Uh, well, I'm just wondering, you know, how do you, how are you finding the assessment part of this to be for, you, for your kids? I'm just thinking about some of mine and I feel that in the connective part of my lesson, especially in the beginning of the lesson, I try, I've been trying to spend some more time there and just to ask questions and to connect with the other person across the screen. It, whereas in, in some ways I wasn't doing that before mm -hmm. working this way, right? So do you have any advice or, or ways we can think about assessing kids since we are working on screens? Like, have you, yeah. I don't know. Well, I think it's always good to start with assessing yourself. Like when you're thinking about states, if we're think changing our lens to like, okay, I'm gonna be thinking about states. I think a really good place to start with is assessing yourself because the other, the thing we know about um, nervous system states, right, that, that hierarchy, and I can pull the ladder back up if it's helpful to see, but, um, you know, we want to match nervous system states, right? So if I'm in a fight or flight, children are going to meet me at my fight or flight. And we all know that if you're a parent, if you've ever gotten in a fight with someone, like we, we join that person. And one of the hardest things when you talk to parents, therapists, whatever, when you're dealing with a difficult situation is how do I stay? How do I stay in my safe and social state? Um, because I want my child, right? That's that co-regulation. I want that child to meet me there. And if we match states, then we're just going to have two nervous systems in a fight or flight. Um, so I think a really good place to start is like checking in with yourself, which feels like perhaps like cliche or we've heard it before, but thinking about it differently. How am I feeling going into this session? Am I feeling annoyed? Am I feeling on edge? Am I feeling nervous? Am I feeling tired and I feel, you know, where am I? And like, how am I going to get myself safe and social? I also thinking about myself, I always like to remind myself, like, what is my goal here? Do I have an agenda? And if I have an agenda, you know, how flexible am I ready to be with that agenda? Because I hit brick walls sometimes when it's like my way or the highway. That for me lately has been one way to end a remote session <laughs> quickly. <laughs> um, yeah, I could see that. Yeah. yeah. So like thinking about your, fle you know, how flexible am I right now? Do I have that freedom? Do I, maybe I don't, maybe, you know, it's, I realize that, you know, therapists, teachers, we all come with our different set of goals or challenges, things parents want us to be getting done. But I always think to myself, like, where's my flexibility here? That helps me stay in a safe and social state for, for myself. Um, that's so really, yeah, that's really good advice. I was talking with uh, another professional this week who was struggling. I think I can sort of quantify or qualify it as being um, in a, in a place of the, you know, where you're talking about feeling unsafe, but then the parents also are feeling that way. And so the child of course is not able to work through their lessons. And yeah. so it seems like what I'm, sort of connecting here is also the importance for us as professionals to reach out to the parents and provide them with support. Like Jamie, you have to do, I imagine with PT, I'm sure all of your parents have to be intimately involved in, in your work at this point, mm -hmm. right? I mean, how would you say that's connective in your experience too? 
Yeah, I was actually just going to think about jumping into what Rebecca was saying about checking in with ourselves, but also the third piece of it, which is, I mean, most of my sessions, the parent has to do with the child yeah. um, and I'm guiding them through it. So if I'm in a good state, maybe the kids in the good, you know, in following the state of the parent, you know, that's the, the kind of um, other factor. Um, so yeah, I have reached out much more than ever with my families during this time and checking in, how are things going? How did that session go? What went right? What went wrong? You know, how can we better set it up for next time? A lot of it is about the environment and what's around. A lot of families are not even in their, their home. You know, they're in different places. They're in, you know, whether it's a parent's house or a rental or wherever, and they don't know their environment, you know, quite well yet either. And so um, I think it's been a lot of, a lot more preparation in that respect of kind of setting things up and making sure to create that um, environment or space, at least for that time being that, that the child has to focus for for that session. But I, I will say that I've had to be very flexible as well and kind of go with the flow and see where the kid is leading. And, mm -hmm. and, and it's good too, that you can kind of have a, a view of what they have or what's going on. And then I'll say, Oh, look, you have that right there. Let's try that, pull it in, use this, you know? Um, so some of it's been a little bit more planned out and some's been more kind of off the cuff, you know, depending on what I'm getting from the session. Yeah. I think that's really in line with my experience. And then it's so interesting, right? When you, when you do um, have a kid who then, you know, when you make a suggestion, like they'll run with it. And then, so, right, like that's such a great moment of, oh, we, we had that flexibility. We had that safety. We ran with my idea and, or the times when it's like the brakes go up. What, so what happened there, right? What was the suggestion? What happened? So both, whatever the outcome is, I think, you know, both can be really interesting and, and then good processing with the parent. I feel the same way you do. Um, Jamie, just doing a lot more processing with parents. Um, I'm trying to do written like recaps of what we did because I think parents, again, respecting like their own stress load that just having something in writing like this was what happened today. We're going to try this next time helps just to organize everyone, but a lot more, a lot more um, parent collaboration, which is never a bad thing. No. It's, never, it's never a bad thing, but I do feel that perhaps we could pause here for just a second and talk about parent involvement just a little bit, because I think it is so crucial for providers to understand the perspective of what's possible there. And, um, you know, I definitely have gone out of my way to be proactive in communicating with my parents around the way that lessons might look now is different than what they were before, uh, because you might see some more time engaging with your kid around play. I might even allow your child to do fun things with me just so we can build a connection and a rapport a little bit more than I would have if we were meeting in person or, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and, or we might also decrease the time that we're spending with each other and make our lessons more frequent to continue to build that that social connection. So I've adapted in some of those ways. And I think for, you know, me as a parent and for my parents, I've also just sort of asked what works for them. Like I mentioned some things that I'm doing and then I kind of say, would that be helpful for you? Or can you think of something else that would be helpful? And it's been very interesting as I've asked these questions, I realized how much I assume sometimes of the families that I work with, because I'm, I'm really surprised actually as to how individualized their responses are. Like I have one family that really wants to have daily interaction, another family saying, please just call me on the weekend or send me one email then, or I really just trust you. Could you just do it? I don't have the bandwidth, right? It's too overwhelming for me. I need you to hold this like in its pocket right now because I'm overwhelmed, right? So there's, there's this um, permission that I'm giving myself now to act very differently with each of my cases, which has been really nice in some ways, I think. But also, um, I wonder what your thoughts are on all that. 
I mean, I think that's a really great example of, you know, again, really um, respecting people's individual differences, right? We think about that a lot, or at least I think a lot about that with a kid, the kids I'm working with, right? Like everyone has their own individual differences, but sometimes we don't always extend that, you know, philosophy or lens to the parents we work with. And it does become like, not one size fits all, but like, these are the strategies, this, you know, implement, implement. And I think now more than ever, that's really respecting, again, bringing it back to the theory that, that, you know, if I'm going to stay social engaged and connected and keep that parent in a safe and social state with me, I have to really hear what they need. I have to validate that it's okay if what I'm selling isn't what they're buying and we can find another way or we can, there's, oh, there's always other inroads. Um, I think parents need that, that sensitivity and that compassion now more than ever. Um, so I think, um, I think that really, again, and I, and I think when we don't do that, you might see parents that you lose, right? They, the defenses go up and again, just bringing it back to the theory, we know that you can't be in a safe and social state once you've gone down the ladder. So you can't problem solve with another person. You almost can't hear their ideas anymore once you've gone down the ladder. So once you feel a family has gone down the ladder, like obviously, or I hope, they're not physically fighting you, but it might be just a flavor in their voice that you're getting. Uh, again, if you're in Zoom, it might be a posture they're giving you. But if you feel like you've lost them, that's the time to like regroup, change the, the angle and bring them back to a safe and social place where we can continue to problem solve. So what what does work? What does work in that state? Like, let's say you do have a kid in a family who's just on total shutdown, meltdown, avoidance, maybe you, you know, you, you sort of try to schedule and they're not reaching back out. You know, the kid needs to work right now. What are some strategies? I mean, I'm just, I can think of a few, but I mean, I, I'm interested in hearing your ideas there. What do you do in that case? I mean, my strategies being totally transparent are probably more robust for working with like the kids. Um, but you know, uh, and I'm, Flex, I'm exercising that muscle because I'm working so much more now with parents, um, which I, I really am enjoying. Um, you know, with kids, we know one of the best, you know, we know that ways that help bring people back up the ladder um, are things like breathing, which is so, you know, it's so said over and over again, but it's just so true, right? When we take deep breaths, we know that the, you know, the exhale stimulates that ventral vagus nerve. Um, we know that slowing down speed can sometimes be interpreted as a cue of danger. So slowing down is so helpful for kids. It is also so helpful for grownups. Um, it's also helpful for ourselves. So slowing down is something I should do all the time with kids and I'm doing more with grownups, just making sure I'm not going too fast because again, speed, lots of things moving, me going quickly could be perceived as like a cue of danger. Um, I'm doing, you know, sometimes Dr. Poor just writes a lot about uh, speaking in more of like a, having more of a prosthetic or um, sing-songy voice, having more of like a, t a rhythm to your, the, you know, again, you're not gonna talk to, grownups or even older children, like their babies, but just making sure you have like a bouncy kind of or flowing quality to your voice that's often heard better and received better and keeps us in sort of a safe and social state than if I go really flat or monotone. So again, if you're feeling like you're losing a kid or feeling like you're losing a parent, you could just kind of like try it on. Like if you sort of, you know, go up a little bit or, you know, again, it would, could be really subtle, but they might pick up on it. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, um, I think that choice, our nervous system wants choice. Um, uh, we, so when I work with parents, I will often say like, if I'm giving a list of suggestions, something I've started doing is saying like, I'm going to list you five things, pick two, pick mm. one, mm. but go with your guts. What speaks to you? What strategy resonates with your family culture and your, I think that's like, cause parents, we want choice. And especially now, many of our lives have become so mundane, right? So repetitive. 
groundhog day, right? Like we desperately want like feelings of choice and kids want that, right? The blue plate or the green plate. Parents want that. We all want that. So instead of a laundry list of things to do, pick what feels good to you. Let me know like what strategy might you guys want to try this week um, is something I've been trying and I think parents have been responding well to um, what, you know, so those are a few things I've been trying, but I'm open to like what you guys think just on your own, from your own work and time, what you guys have been finding kind of, whether you were thinking polyvagal, but just like, what have you found keeps parents like with you? What would you say, Jamie? I, I really, from a therapist standpoint, um, I try not to overwhelm my families. So, you know, in a 30 minute session, I might do eight to 10 different things with a kid, but I'll never leave all of that with the family. You know, I'm going to pick out, like Becky said, Becca said, two or three things for them to focus on for, you know, the time in between. I'm going to see them again, and then I might switch it up and give them a different two or three things, but really keeping it to a minimum and, and, and kind of having them schedule like three 10 minute sessions a day to work on what I want them to do, you know, very short, but more, you know, a couple frequent times, but something that's very manageable, um, where they can just focus for those 10 minutes and, and do those two activities, you know, um, I feel like that's less overwhelming. And then something from a parent perspective, I have a child, um, who receives many sessions of PT, OT, speech, and everything's classroom stuff all week. And I've just had to prioritize for her, for, for, her, for me, for everybody's kind of sanity and, you know, what's important this week. And it might be different from what it was last week. I might see that she needs, you know, her music class this week, whereas, you know, last week that didn't work out so well and we only, you know, she really needed more PT or her OT. And so, you know, I think it's okay right now and what we're going through to, to not do it all um, and to not think that you can manage it all. And, and that if you can't manage it all, your child probably can't manage it all either. And so, you know, um, looking for signs from them to see what they might be able to manage and um, what they might need more this week than last week and kind of setting that up so that, um, you know, they're successful in the times that they do spend in the session, you know, getting the most out of those five sessions you pick for the week or whatever it might be, you know, so that's been something that's been helpful for us here. Makes good sense. Makes good sense. I feel like, you know, from an educator standpoint, I think it's been really interesting because you have to always be like assessing um, in a more formative way and just trying to figure out where, you know, where your child is that you're teaching, where that child is in their development of what you're trying to teach. And so in some ways I've been asking my students to perform more for me so I can really assess whether or not they understand it. And some, and a secondary piece of, of that that I didn't expect that would happen is that I feel like I'm making much more progress actually because I keep asking them to say it back or sign things back to me so that I can understand that they understand, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so in some ways that engagement has been really helpful. Um, and I, I do feel that teachers are not always aware of the um, things that therapists are, right? Like the even polyvagal theory, I'm sure I read about it in some class I took as an undergraduate student, but since then I have not looked back at it. So, you know, Becky and I were just talking, especially as we got this uh, series going, we were just talking about how an opportunity around this time for us has been to dive back into the books and have to look at some theories and see how we can kind of take those theories and help us make sense of this new way of operating our work. And, um, you know, it certainly does seem to me to be important to um, celebrate, you know, when certain things are really working and to share that information with, with other professionals um, I think probably also as a special educator, I've been really privileged in being able to team up with therapists all the time. So I'm probably, you know, more comfortable in 
asking an OT or asking a PT or asking a speech and language pathologist about their work and how that actually would inform my ability to teach. Um, but I think now is a really great time for educators to be curious about what's happening in the therapeutic sense, because often I feel like what we're doing right now with kids is very therapeutic in nature uh, in terms of providing education in a way that has to be connective. It has to be um, you know, personalized and it has to have these every day can, you know, consistent pieces in order to make progress. So, um, yeah, I've, I've been thinking a lot about that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know if that connects any of that connects to what you're thinking about as well. Absolutely. And I think that we all need to be, as we work with children, um, I think the, the context of the, the backdrop that is happening has to be considered. I, you know, how, however it affects a family, um, I kind of think it's, it's a piece of the environment that is, that is at play and has to be taken into consideration. And to your point, I think um, the connected way, you know, that connecting with other people is so, like, like we talked about, is such a, it's a biological imperative. We don't do well in isolation, as many of us are learning. Um, it's incredibly challenging to our nervous system. It, it, that in itself is a neuroception of danger to our species, right? To be so alone at diff at, in varying degrees. So I think um, teachers, like you said, have this incredible, teachers, therapists, anyone working with ch children remotely have this incredible opportunity to be that, to be that, you know, nugget of, connect of another connection during the day. That's so, so important. So for me, you know, my handwriting goals, like we'll get there. My, you know, my, the pincer grasp will get there. Like if I, I don't want to be battling with a kid for that 30 minutes, I want to be connecting. Um, and if we can do that while we're handwriting, that's great. And if we can't, then the handwriting will come and we'll just connect another way. Cause it is that, um, it's that, I think the connection piece is so, so important right now. I really do. So do you think that children right now, it's, it's uh, suffice to say that children who are going through this period of time right now will um, have some setbacks, do you think, overall in their development because we're dealing with that need to connect over the skills that we're tasked to teach or to, to work on in therapy? Do you think one is is it, is it one or the other, or, or is it possible to happen in tandem? I just say this because I sort of have been thinking a lot about time right now, and I've been thinking about how summer is coming up, and I have children with special needs in my life, and I'm always thinking about how, I, you know, they're, they're, I've coined this quote, which is, their brains are only going to be this age once, and I feel this sort of urgency or sense of urgency in helping them develop in the ways that I was before. Mm -hmm. And, I'm, you know, I'm feeling disappointed that I can't do some of that forward work in the same way that I did because I'm having to do some things we've already talked about here. Um, it sort of leads me to think is like one mutually exclusive from the other. Is it feeling that way to you guys as well? I, I just wonder if we're on mark, like, are we doing the right thing by our kids by taking pauses, you know, part of me in the summertime camps aren't going to be here. And I'm like, you know, kind of feeling nervous about letting time just go by in some ways, especially for some of our kids. So I don't know if you're feeling that way too, but. Jamie, do you want to weigh in or? I mean, I think regression goes with change, right? And you're going to see those moments happening because there's been so much change kids aren't going to school they're not seeing their friends they're not maybe in their same house they're not you know nothing is nothing is the same mm -hmm. um so i think we, we have to expect that and i think that um you know we have to also hope that as as things kind of get to a new normal or we get back to whatever that that new normal is that they will start to pick up and and move forward um i don't think um at least in my particular case like i i can't 
bombard with too many things to try to catch up because it's just going to, like I said, overwhelm the situation. So we've just been trying to do our best um, uh, in each aspect of the fields and kind of, you know, um, build on what I'm able to do, right? Because I'm not a special educator. <laughs> I'm a PT, so I can do those kinds of things with my daughter. But, um, and I think as far as my kids that I treat, um, for for me, the connection piece is important, but I know right now kids are very connected to their parents because their parents are home all the time. And I've been building on that and using that. Um, so sometimes, you know, I might not even say hi to the screen, you know, the child in the screen, they'll know I'm there. We might sing a song at the end and close things out, but really like I'm watching them kind of connect with their parent and do what I would be doing and you know I've coached the mom or the dad through that and that's been a nice thing to see too because then I also know everything that I'm teaching is getting carry carried over not just in my session but throughout the week because you know the parents were really getting hands-on and and that time and we have the benefit of that right now um I love that you know I, have so. quick, I have a quick connection to make in an educational standpoint on that is that um I have a kid who I've just been working with on reading and writing and he was a reluctant reader and writer. And we built so much fun around reading and writing over the past couple of weeks that he's just wanting to do it all of the time. And it's, I, I, I sort of wonder, I guess, I think he's building a connection now to not me, but he's building a connection to something to do that he's loving. And I suppose that's another way of thinking about it, which I hadn't really connected before. You said that about the parents connecting with your kids. That's really yeah. interesting. Yeah. I, yeah, I completely agree. I love, I mean, it's almost really the, you know, depending on like what frame of reference you use in your therapy, but you know, I, I think it's the ultimate win when like the therapist can kind of like start to creep back in the magic can happen between the kid and the child, especially in the type of work that Jamie and I do when that magic can be happening. Like that's, that's the jackpot, right? Cause then you're hitting, you're firing on all levels. You're getting the motor work in that we're potentially doing, but we're also getting that co-regulation with mom and dad. And those are the ultimate co-regulators. Those are like your pillars of co-regulation. So you're really, I think you're getting like, you're getting such a big bang for your buck when, when, when the parents can be kind of like picking up that role. Um, but again, like we talked about being sensitive that for whatever reasons, when parents can't or whatever else is at play, but, um, you know, in terms of the regression, I think, and does it have to be mutually exclusive? I think if you can have connection, right, the safe and social with the skill building, that's like the, that's, that's the dream. But, you know, I think when that can happen, for me at this point, you know, pre-COVID, mid-COVID, post-COVID, I'll always pick the connection because if I'm skill building without connection, I mean, I'm not, I'm not making lasting change for, in my opinion, and based on what I, you know, what I think the science says in terms of what we know when kids learn best, um, when we want to be building, you know, those, that circuitry, you know, we want them in a safe and social state. Because if they're not, then we can't have as robust, um, long lasting. So, mm -hmm. but, but yeah, if it can all be happening together, like that's the dream. That's the dream, right? Exactly. Exactly. Well, and it seems like, happen, and I know teachers are doing it across the country and therapists, like, and that's incredible, right? They're making it fun. They're making it meaningful and they're making it skill-based. Right seems like those are this that's the secret sauce right that's kind of what we all need to be focusing on which I yeah. think value of us talking about this today just to help people from different perspectives in this work come together and kind of agree on some good practices at this point right yeah yeah um so I guess just, uh, you know in in some or in you know in closing um I I do feel that it's so essential for us just to go back to the basics of different theories and different um, ways of thinking about our kids at this time, especially. And so 
Um, I don't know, is there anything else that either of you wanted to bring up before we close out or are we feeling good about where, we, where we've landed? <laughs> um, no, I feel really good. And again, I'll just say like, I gave like a really small taste, but like if there's any part of this that speaks to you or like something clicked for me, like it just clicked, it, it made sense to me and it, it described so much of what I was seeing and gave me then the science to understand why I was seeing what I was seeing. So I really encourage you, um, if you're into science and anatomy and physiology, there's so much of that stuff. But if you're not into that, like there's lots of people who do, you know, who don't focus on that part of the, you know, so there's, there's something for everyone. Yeah. Um, and there's so much information out there. And, and again, it, it, it goes deep and there's, there's lots to be had there, but I hope just this big, the big, uh, the broad picture um, gives you something to think about. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for sure it has for me. So I'm really grateful. And um, Jamie, did, did you have anything you wanted to say sort of in sum or uh, closing, closing thoughts? No, um, you know, this has been really great. And I've, uh, you know, kind of put into practice finally, um, you know, things that I knew I needed to do based on this theory, just from listening to the talk. And um, it's, it's already just made a big difference in our lives here. So um, it's, it's great to hear about and, and has motivated me to kind of, like you said, Mary, we kind of go back to basics and kind of, you know, back to the roots of what, where all of this is stemming from. And um, so this has been great. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. of course. I have you. Awesome. Well, thanks everyone. Thanks for, I'll, I'll make sure we uh, put your email addresses on the uh, channel's um, bio. And also just so that you know, you know, Evolved is also really curious about talking with professionals this time around these kinds of ideas, just to share resource information to improve our practices with kids. And um, so if you're interested in learning more about what we do, we're happy to have that. And I know Becky and Jamie have wonderful practices as well that you can check out and gain plenty of resources from as well. So thank you so much for joining today. And I'm going to pull us off the recording. Just give me a minute.